So now it turns out Carter Storacci is leaning towards coming back to Penn State for a fifth NCAA season, but not at 174. It sounds like it could be at 184, maybe even 197. And a move like this gives Penn State a lot more options to work with for the 2024-25 lineup. You are locked on Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Obviously, nothing is set in stone, but for this hypothetical move to work, it needed to be mutually beneficial for both Penn State Wrestling and Carter Storacci if he was going to return for a fifth NCAA season. This is Locked On Nittany Lions. I'm your host, Zach Sako. Thanks so much for making us your first listen and watch every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. And I want all of you to be active in this discussion. We got plenty to talk about Carter Storacci, the drama between Jordan Burroughs and Mitchell Messenbrink, the Penn State crowd, right? The drama from that. And then Jason Nolf and Aaron Brooks's magic as well. So please be active in the comments section and join the discussion for this one. Also, shout out to the listener, a viewer of the show for stopping me at the Bryce Jordan Center during one of the sessions for the Olympic trials and just saying that he liked the show a lot. I really appreciate that. I really do. It meant a lot. And I really appreciate all of you. Like I said, join the discussion, join this conversation. As we begin with Carter Storacci's potential weight change performance at the Olympic trials, but he did an interview recently with Flow Wrestling and alluded to that he was leaning towards a 60-40% chance that he's going to come back to Penn State. Originally, it was that 40-60. to So that was the vibe on this show, whether it was myself or Jeff Byers, the voice of Penn State Wrestling. That's the kind of indication that we had that Carter was leaning away from returning to Penn State. But now this kind of changes things because this was the, the anticipation was that he was going to wrestle at 174 and maybe not make a move. Heck, we just did a preview of the Olympic trials and Jeff said, I don't know that Carter makes a move to 184 or 197. But then he does that interview and reveals that there is interest in potentially moving to that spot. And Jeff said the only way, the only way is if if Carter were to come back for a fifth NCAA season, it was it had to be so that he could train and compete at the senior level for internationals, right? Prepare for all of that and then wrestle in select matches. The blueprint is there. See Kyle Snyder's collegiate career when he wrestled at Ohio State. He wrestled in select matches while simultaneously wrestling in, you know, at the international competitions, Pan Ams and things like that. So if you look at what Snyder did, Carter can do a similar thing. Wrestle in about five, maybe six Big Ten dual meets, the one, you know, the conference ones matter the most and then qualify for the Big Ten tournament, qualify for NCAAs, and win that fifth NCAA title. So now there is an opportunity for both sides to mutually benefit. Penn State returns, arguably, you know, Aaron Brooks, of course, you know, just won the Hodge Trophy and would argue as far as who is the best overall wrestler. But whether you think it's Carter or Aaron, you are getting, he would be the best returning wrestler out of all of them to come back for that next, for this upcoming season for 2024 and 2025. Carter could not wrestle at 174 and compete internationally because that's tough. Since there are only six Olympic weights, since there are only, you know, you go through, right, and and everything. Carter, if he was going to be at 174 collegiately, and then he would have to move around, cut weight, gain weight. That's why he didn't, that's why he didn't wrestle at 74 kilograms because that's 163 pounds. He would have had to cut nine pounds in order to do that. And that is, very tough to do but at 184 one I, I think nine 197 even makes more sense and carter mentioned that you know his, he said his dad was really excited for that move to 197 he would then have to avoid cutting weight all the time and fluctuating back and forth to wrestle in college to wrestle in the in these outside competitions right carter wrestling at 197 he would wrestle at 197 hypothetically and then just give up the weight Because the exact weight of 86 kilograms is roughly 189 pounds. So then Carter would just give up the weight and wrestle at 197, which he could very much do, obviously. He can stay at 189 pounds, 86 kilos, and wrestle at 197 collegiately. 
And this opens up again, Penn State and Carter knew that he was the best wrestler at 174 and nobody was going to be able to challenge him. This opens up a whole new slate of competition to guys he hasn't faced or relatively been in the same bracket weight class, close to it even. And now he is because of the Olympics competing internationally, right? But remember, Carter has told us that he does not like school. He does not want to be in school anymore and take classes. So from a wrestling standpoint and a competition standpoint, it's perfect. It makes a ton of sense. From an academic standpoint, well, that, that's a bit of a different story. So Carter and, and Kale Sanderson are going to discuss that after the Olympic trials. But this gives Penn State wrestling a lot more options to work with for the back end of that lineup in 2024 and 2025. The options that I look at for the lineup, okay, right? 174. Well, Alex Facundo was formerly the 165 pound wrestler. He was wrestling at one, he was wrestling at 74 kilos. That translates to 163 pounds. He can move up to 174, either sacrifice some weight or make that weight by the time the season rolls around. So Alex Facundo becomes your 174 starter. Josh Barr becomes your 184 starter. Now, this complicates things if Carter does, in fact, take 184. But I think to, in order to avoid fluctuating weight so that he can train at 189, 86 kilos, then he can just give up the weight at 197 pounds. And it's Josh Barr's turn. It is Josh Barr's turn. He's ready to go, and he is the 184 starter. So here you get to 197. You have Carter Storacci. You have Lucas Cochran. You have Connor Mirasola. I'm going to have more on Mirasola in this discussion as well. But then Storacci wrestles your select matches. Now you have the potential to redshirt the future, one of the future best wrestlers in Penn State history. Connor Mirasola truly has the opportunity, the talent to win four NCAA titles. You can perfect that path by potentially redshirting him. Maybe he wrestles some select matches as well. And that also opens up the door for Luke, Lucas Cochran. So you can have three co-starters here for Penn State and then Alton, but you need to have that conversation. How does Connor feel about that? How does Lucas feel about that? That you're going to wrestle the regular season and then Carter takes over when the postseason rolls around. And then at 285, it just provides insurance. It provides insurance if Carter takes that 197 spot because then what about Greg Kirkley? You could do the same thing with Greg Kirkley. Have him wrestle in select matches. Allow him to train internationally. And then you can have Cochran wrestle up a little bit. Maybe you have Connor Mirasola again. Maybe they want to preserve that red shirt, but it allows you more options. And you could have a wrestle-off scenario between Cochran and Mirasola, kind of like David Evans and Tyler Kasak. And we saw how that turned out here. And I think Connor Mirasola would win. Besides the point, the wrestle-off, it just allows Penn State so much more flexibility for that 2024-2025 lineup. Now, as far as Carter's performance at the Olympic trials, it did not surprise me. I thought it was a toss-up between him and Trent Hidley. I leaned Carter just because I think Carter is the more talented wrestler. But remember, Carter was not, is not 100%. And again, he moved up an entire weight class at the Olympic level. So it's not like he went from 174 to 184. He went from 174 to 189 and was probably giving up weight. I can't imagine that he put on 15 pounds in a month span. Maybe he did. He's an incredible athlete. But that match against Pat Downey, Pat Downey was never going to win. Come on. that Downey, I can't imagine that he was serious about this. I think this was kind of almost a challenge to see if he could, you know, pull a funny one here and upset Carter Storacci at the Olympic level, make him look silly. And, and that didn't happen. And down, he said, you know, Hey, I was, I was unconditioned. I, I didn't train well. I'm going to have to get back into it. Carter was obviously much more conditioned with him. That's why the second period went all the way in favor of Storacci. And when just looking at it, researching this matchup, when was the last time Downey even wrestled at the freestyle level against this kind of competition? It, it, 2020, I, th that's what I found in my notes. So for, for Downey, he was never going to beat Carter, but he did give him a fight. He did put up a, a good fight, good effort in the first period, and then Carter took over in the second. Now, this is when uh, Trent Hiley, Trent Hiley is really good. Trent Hiley is very good. He's a two-time state high school champion. Again, he's always played second fiddle at either 184 or 197 to Aaron Brooks. If Aaron Brooks did not exist, and thank goodness he does, Trent Hiley 
would be a, probably a multi NCAA champion in his own right. The only thing that was standing in his way every single time, the semifinals, the finals, it was Aaron Brooks. So if that's what we're comparing the competition level to, uh, Trent Hidley winning the way he did, it was a close one. It was six to four, right? But Trent Hidley is that good. And I'm not surprised that he was able to defeat Carter. And again, he was at 197 pounds. So think about that for a moment. Trent Hidley has been wrestling, competing against guys that are in that similar, that are around that 86 kilo weight class for this entire season of NCAAs. Carter was wrestling at 174 and then on the fly had to train and compete like he was, you know, gaining 15 pounds. That is difficult to do on top of the knee, on top of the leg, whatever it is, right? We don't know. We will, we probably truly won't know for some time what it actually is. MCL, ACL, we thought it was a hyperextended knee originally because that's the first reports that came out, but it is a serious injury. Carter was not 100% for this tournament and it showed and Hidley 100% and wrestled his tail off. So Starachi was never going to make it far. It was either cut from 174 to 163, which was probably nearly impossible, which is why he moved up to 86 kilos. 15 pound difference. Again, he was going up against guys that have been training in this spot for years where he was specifically training at this spot for what? Four to six weeks on a not so great leg. I am not surprised that he chose to injury default because I don't know how much it was worth to, to get into the Olympic trials, especially after you lost to Trent. Maybe things are different, right? If he beats Trent, but I, I'm not surprised that he made that decision. But back to the lineup, Carter said that he is going to talk to Kale in, in some time after the Olympic trials here. He said it was 60-40 in favor of returning with the potential of moving to 184. 197 makes a lot more sense here. For him to be in the starting lineup, it allows him to train for nationals, world championships at that 86 kilo spot. He just gives up the weight. And it's a puzzle piece that fits right into Penn State's lineup and gives Kale Sanderson more flexibility. What's not to like about this whole scenario? Now coming up, oh my goodness, there was a lot of drama. Session two, seeing it in person, Mitchell Messenbrink, Jordan Burroughs, Nolf Burroughs. It was as exciting as it could have been. It also came with a lot of controversy. We're going to discuss that on the other side of this break. And today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or as a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard isn't looking too good. You're feeling low. You're not sure if you or your team can pull out a win. But that's when you dig deep. Lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game. Let's pull off some bank heists and take as much money of my friends as I possibly can. That's right, the smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but now on your phone, anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. And there's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards, make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball, and charge other players rent. For your iconic properties. You can even work together with your friends. So not just against them, but with them to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb that leaderboard. So get back out there, put your game face on and download Monopoly Go. That's Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. Mitchell Messenbrink versus Jordan Burroughs. Well, it was certainly nothing short of exciting, but it also came with a lot of controversy and people are out in droves once again saying that Penn State wrestling fans are not so great. And that's that's fine. I will sugarcoat it that way, but that's that's where the conversation is leading to. But let's address the booing because that's what so forget the mess and brink and the Burroughs match itself for just a moment, but the extracurriculars that came along with it. The booing, some of the comments from the crowd. Penn State fans had every right to boo Burroughs after this match. So after the Messenbrink match, Burroughs shoved Messenbrink in the back of the head towards the end of the match and shoved his head into the mat towards the end of this one between the two wrestlers. Now, during the match, 
a little bit of a different story. I think it's fun, spirited banter, booing somebody. Again, Mitchell Messenbrink wrestles for Penn State. Of course, there's going to be bias here. Messenbrink taunts. We know this. That's that's part of his style. It's his wrestling. A finger wag against David Carr. So it, it's cool when Messenbrink taunts, but when Burroughs does, I, I guess not. Burroughs has obviously earned every single right to taunt no matter who his opponent is, to, to match what Messenbrink's type of intensity, his energy is with the taunting, or anybody else. Again, see his Wikipedia page. He has every single right to say and do what he wants. He just kept adjusting his socks, taking his time, getting back to the, the center of the mat after almost every single break. To, to say to Mitchell, to imply to him that, no, you are not a challenge. Hell, he could have taken an entire lap around the mat each time there was a pause because Burroughs has earned that right. So the booing, I think that's fun. That's just the fun of the game here, right? But Messenbrink and Burroughs turned up the intensity when it came to that back and forth, that push and pull, and so did the crowd. Was was everybody just supposed to sit on their hands, snap, the, snap their fingers, right, to, to applaud, you know, quiet clap? This wasn't a golf outing. This was a wrestling match where people have been talking trash for the past month, whether it was Carter and Jordan, right? We know the type of wrestler that Mitchell Messenbrink is and how he approaches these matchups. Once again, I, I see the comments, oh, Penn State fans are the worst, and this is how they behave. It is a Penn State crowd at a Penn State arena with a Penn State wrestler being taunted and then shoved into the match with force. There were some people that said, Flow Wrestling said that this could have been a disqualification potentially. It didn't resort to that. Now, up to debate whether the ref should have stepped in and said, hey, Mitchell, knock it off. Hey, Jordan, knock it off. Whatever the case is. But the, uh, the potential of a disqualification tells you how much intent was behind that shove from Burroughs into Messenbrink. So it was serious. But at the end of the day, what do you expect from the crowd? I lay it out for you that the entire crowd is almost blue and white, and, and this is where we're at. Burroughs was talking the same amount of trash all month long leading up to it, and yes, I saw the video. I saw the one video of your career is over, your career is over, your career is over, and then that's followed up to say that Penn State should never host events like this again because the crowd's too biased. Again, what do you expect? for a Penn State crowd with a Penn State wrestler at Penn State's venue. But what they don't show you in that same section, so you see the video go viral of one person, one individual saying, hey, Jordan, your career's over, your career is over, your career is over. But what they don't show you is that same section around the tunnel giving him a standing ovation, other fans in the Bryce Jordan Center giving Burroughs a standing ovation. That was a video of one person saying his career is over. And then let's tie it into the five anonymous accounts that wrote nasty comments under an ex-recruits post saying that he was decommitting from Penn State and opening up his recruitment. I, I'm obviously not condoning any sort of behavior from anonymous ex accounts to uh, somebody in the crowd trying to taunt Jordan Burroughs. But I see way too many wrestling commentators, wrestling spectators, going, yep, Penn State fans are bad every chance they get. Any other fan base acts like this, and it's called passion. It's passion, it's spirit. I think it made the match that more. It was my, it was my favorite match. Messenbrink versus Burroughs. Yes, I know there were other ones, right? Yes, Brooks and Valencia, but in terms from the, en the entertainment value, from the entertainment value, this was my favorite match. It was intense. I, I like the poor sportsmanship. I like the taunting from both sides because it was entertaining. And on the show, we expected nothing less. We knew that Mitchell Messenbrink was going to do this to try to rattle Jordan Burroughs. He already plays mental games, right? So it, it, it absolutely made sense that he was going to turn it up another notch. So you think as a severe underdog, Messenbrink wasn't going to pull out the stops for him, Jordan Burroughs? He'll finger wag at David Carr, a great guy in the NCAA championship. What do you think he's going to do? with Jordan Burroughs standing across from him. Now, Burroughs versus, and, and we knew that we knew that Mitchell was most likely going to lose, obviously most likely going to lose this one. Burroughs is in a different class compared to Mitchell, but Mitchell is well on his way to competing at this level. He's going to have a long career at the freestyle, at the freestyle competitions. 
Then there's Jordan Burroughs versus Jason Null. What a match. Jeff Byers called it. Jeff Byers called it, yes, on the radio on 98.7 in State College, but he also called it here. He predicted that Jason Nolf would take out Jordan Burroughs and move on. So all the titles say shocking upset. All the reports, recaps say what an upset. Can't believe it happened. Jeff Byers said it on the show. So here on Locked on Nittany Lions, we were not surprised. If you watched the show, you knew this was coming. Jason Nolf beat Burroughs at his own game. Incredible defense mixed with mistake-free wrestling. For for Bur from Burrow's perspective, though, he had to wrestle through potentially if he was going to make it all the way four Nittany Lion Club wrestlers in total to get back to the Olympics. And normally he does not have to do this. He is normally the one waiting, whereas this time it was Kyle Dake. And age is not just a number. If Jaden Cox is retiring, leaving his shoes on the mat at the age of 29, Burroughs is 35. So there eventually there is going to be that type of regression. And, and Burroughs was taken to his limits from all facets of the sport of wrestling here. Bakundo made him work early on. Like Burroughs didn't have any easy ones. So on top of not waiting for the competition to come to him by being in the championship, the best two out of three. He had to wrestle his way there. Bakundo gave him a hell of a match. He wore him down. Mitchell Messenbrink wore him down spiritually, emotionally. And then by the time he saw Nolf, physically, he was not able to withstand it. For Nolf, Nolf wrestled a perfect match. Shutting out Jordan Burroughs, shutting him out three to nothing, fending off every single attack, every counter that Burroughs had and then towing the line to avoid those push-out points, which is Burroughs' you know, name of the game, right? You know, little by little. That's what he did to Facundo, but the same thing's not going to work against Nolf. And Nolf is in his prime, and Burroughs, turning the corner here, is behind his. Again, you wrestle them maybe 10 more times, sure, they split, but that's where Nolf is right now because they were close just recently, and then this time around, Nolf gets his revenge. Now, there was magic in the air, and no, it wasn't David Taylor. Aaron Brooks, magic of his own. Three comeback victories on Friday. We'll discuss them coming up next here on Locked On, Nittany Lions. Today's episode is also brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has all the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing a lot of hats and might not have the time to necessarily hire. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions. 2.5 million, that's right, 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Become one of them. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And I'd like to thank another sponsor on today's episode, and that is FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. It is playoff time in the NBA and NHL baseball's in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on each and every game right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed that is 150 bucks win or lose that's right 150 bucks bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all on an app that is safe secure and super easy to use I can attest to that I use FanDuel myself so what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. That's FanDuel, America's number one sports book. 
How about Aaron Brooks with a little magic of his own? David Taylor's called the magic man, but Brooks, what he was able to do in Friday's sessions of the Olympic trials. Let, let's let's go through all of those select bouts. And then, of course, you know, this he, he sets up another rematch with David Taylor, a fellow Nittany Lion wrestler. So David Taylor's the magic man, but Aaron Brooks, I mean, what what he showed, OK, beginning with the quote unquote easiest of of the day defeats the future of Penn State wrestling in Connor Mirasola 11 to five. No takedowns allowed in this past NCAA season. But then a high school senior, an 18-year-old in Connor Mirasola at the Olympics, got one on Brooks and took the early lead too, right? Took the trailed Mirasola two to one. So there was the first of the comeback, but again, was able to take care of business and went 11 to five. And then there's one of the best in collegiate history, also won here at, at the freestyle competitions, Alex Deeringer. Deeringer had a big four, four point throw out of the gate. And that'll rattle most wrestlers, right? And especially with Deeringer, the way that he's able to fend off shots and his his Olympic game. And Brooks was able to respond accordingly. Brooks came all the way back, won convincingly. It was four to nothing. Deeringer right out of the gate with that four point throw. And it's like, oh man, he has criteria as well. And then Brooks responds with an eight to nothing run and shutting Deeringer out for the remainder of the match. And again, remember the type of competition that he is facing. This isn't just another college-level wrestler. Then, Zahid Valencia, what has turned into this rivalry, because this has gone on for the past, what, four or five years now, back and forth. Valencia took the first two, and then recently, Brooks took last year's in 2023, and now this year's in 2024. And don't get me wrong, we talked about controversy with Messenbrink and Burroughs. This had its own controversy, but the way that Brooks was able to fight back, battle back, get back. Valencia is obviously tough because of this amount of talent that he has, but to go along with the height and length advantage that he has too, Valencia, like Deeringer, secured another four-point throw and Brooks challenged, right? He looked at his corner and said, you know, yeah, we'll take the challenge. Let's throw the brick. And for those who aren't, aren't familiar with freestyle wrestling, you lose a point. If you're, you give up a point, if your challenge is incorrect, you take your challenge away and your opponent gets a point as well. So then he challenged, he lost, and that made the score six to three. And then with 25 seconds in the second period, 25 seconds to go in the entire remainder of the match, 25 seconds. That's when Brooks started to pull off his comeback, pulled off a four point comeback. I hope people understand the difficulty that went along with this. You're at the Olympic trials. You're going up against the Valencia, one of the best wrestlers in the United States. And to even remotely come back within 25 seconds, had a takedown, had a push out, and then the caution against Valencia for the tug of the singlet. So that's how Brooks was able to do this all in 25 seconds. So you want to talk about David Taylor being the magic man. Maybe this is almost fitting when the baton is finally passed. Hey, maybe it's this time around in 2024. Maybe it's in the future. We, we, will, we will know soon enough. But I think it's almost fitting. Again, a wrestling, I've said it's romantic. I've said it on the show, watching Penn State wrestling from the NCAAs. And now at, at the Olympic level, you know, the competition's turning into the international level. It's getting more storybook here that the magic is going to be passed on from David Taylor to Aaron Brooks at some point. So now you have a rematch, Brooks versus Taylor. I am eager to see if Taylor still has it left in the tank to beat an up-and-coming Aaron Brooks who's going to be this much more difficult around in 2024. Has Brooks closed the gap enough, right? They were close. You know, David Taylor still had the command, but they were Brooks gave him a challenge last year at Final X. And this isn't the only Nittany Lion versus Nittany Lion Olympic trials wrestling final. You have Zane Rutherford versus Nick Lee, Jesse Mendez, and Andrew Alirez took them down to the wire. And I don't think it couldn't have gotten any closer. Jesse Mendez is an 11 seed. Uh, that was a disservice. But I, under, I understand since he was competing in NCAAs. And same thing, like Levi Haynes was the lowest seed despite winning the NCAA championship. But those, Mendez was very close to upsetting. And then Alirez almost came back, and Alirez is very good at the freestyle when it comes to freestyle here. And, and of course, don't forget about 57 kilos, Spencer Lee and Thomas Gilman. 
Hawkeye versus Hawkeye. Well, Hawkeye versus former Hawkeye, since now Gilman's a good guy since he wrestles for the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club. But these will be some of the most impeccable matches, entertaining, right? For the purpose uh, of talent and prestige alone and what's on the line with being that representative for the United States at the 2024 Olympics in Paris. I hope all of you enjoyed this content and enjoyed this discussion as much as I did seeing it in person and then being able to recap it and discuss it. Plus with the news that with the Carter, with Carter Storacci's interview and talking about potentially coming back for a fifth NCAA season. I hope you're a part of the discussion too, down in the comments. If you enjoyed this content, leave a like, subscribe. If you're not already become an everyday or subscribe to locked on Nittany lines on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast for the latest conversations around your favorite Penn state sports teams and so much more.